months ago, the Americans assassinated a top Al-Qaeda figure here. They fired a Hellfire missile at his car from a drone. He had helped plan a suicide attack on the USS Cole when it docked in Yemeni waters back in 2000. This was a sensitive area. An army escort stuck close by us. We've run into checkpoints, probably one every 20 minutes along this road. With me was a journalist from a pro-government newspaper and a minder from the Ministry of Information. Yemen has an elaborate network of tribal loyalties. In Marib, like in other northern provinces, the tribes are fiercely independent. Not long after 9-11, government troops tried to arrest two Al-Qaeda suspects here. They ended up in a firefight with a tribal militia. We stopped at a local market. I hope they keep their safety catchers on. I just see guns pointing in all directions. Look at this boy. He wanted to be a man. <laughs> How old is he? Come on, Brack. Ten years. Ten years old. <laughs> when did he start carrying his gun? Come back, Ahmed Ali. Three years. Three years ago. So he's been carrying it since he was seven. After a few minutes, a town official ordered us to stop filming. Okay. If they said not. Fine, we didn't know, but we didn't know we didn't have permission. Sorry, we're very, very sorry. I really apologize. I did not know we have to see your government. In Yemen, there are 60 million firearms for just 18 million people. Weapons and explosives from Yemen have been linked to post 9-11 Al-Qaeda attacks in Kenya and Saudi Arabia. We've just been told that we have to see the governor first before we can film here, and they want to guide us to Old Marib which is the tourist area. Um, my apologies, I thought we had permission. I retreated to our hotel, watched over by the ubiquitous image of President Ali Abdullah Saleh. He unified North and South Yemen in 1990. We are now completely grounded. After having driven through the desert for hours and hours, we are now in Mara town and all the things we had been promised we could film are suddenly not possible anymore. But the next morning, the American ambassador arrived. We were allowed to film his visit. <laughs> ambassador Edmund Hull was greeted by the local leader, Sheikh Rabish. The ambassador is a counter-terrorism expert. His job is to convince tribal leaders to join the war on terror. The Marib sheikhs know that America views them as a magnet for Al-Qaeda sympathizers. They've seen America can kill its enemies deep inside their territory. Now, most are accepting the carrot of U.S. development aid. These are areas, remote areas, where in the past uh, Al-Qaeda and similar organizations uh, have identified operating space. Uh, and uh, our interest is in denying that operating space uh, to Al-Qaeda. And again, the way you do that is to strengthen the government presence uh, through security measures and through development efforts. After lunch, there was a photo opportunity at a new American-funded health center. But the ambassador's diplomacy and money could not mask the views of the local sheikh. <laughs> Sheikh Abubish is also saying, as for now, they haven't turned against the Americans, but if the Americans are continuing their friendship with the Jews, even though at the moment the relationship is very, very good, they might find it hard to be their friends. We wanted to spend more time in Marib, perhaps even film its vast arms market. We were told we had to leave. Did authorize a visit to a secret location to meet one of the president's advisors, Faris Sanabani. On display in this warehouse were weapons the government has bought at the tribal markets to take them out of circulation. 
The government wants to starve terrorists of the means to carry out attacks. The added benefit is it curtails the power of the tribes. Of all this, this from the Marib area. Are you collected this yeah, in from the Marib area? Is, would you say the Marib area is one of the most heavily armed areas in the country? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, simply because it's desert, and simply because the people there, they're, they love weapons. This is uh, it's, uh, rockets, rocket launchers. They look at these mines. Well, yeah, they're yeah. mines. These mines could be very damaging to vehicles or even to a tank. So does that mean the Yemeni government is actually spending money? They're paying people who turn in their weapons? Absolutely. Yemen had a choice. Should they go for development or should they go for security? And in order to sustain development, in order to develop and bring investment, you need to, to secure the country. So they made a priority to go for security. The weapons that you see here, you see this huge and big depot that we have here, we have a number one, a number of uh, similar to it. Mm -hmm. It cost the Yemeni government 600 billion riyals. Just to give you an estimate uh, of what can be done with 600 billion riyals, you could build 300 schools in Yemen. 300 schools. So they decided, we want security, we want stability. Why? So development can come in, so tourists can come in the country, so investors can come in the country, and tourists, investors, and so on, will bring development and will bring wealth to the nation. It's the economic impact of terror that makes the Yemeni government so keen to placate international opinion. They look pretty big. They could knock out a helicopter or even an airplane for that matter, yes. The Yemeni government also has to struggle with the kind of dislike for America that runs for Yemeni society. We've just come to the hospital of Jibla. Right here, roughly about a year ago, three American Baptist missionaries who were working in the hospital, in fact had been working here for over 10 years, were shot by allegedly radical Islamists. Lee Hickson from the Yemen Baptist Mission escaped the attack. The man, Kamal, uh, who came in that morning, he came in around 6 o'clock in the morning and he, he sat right over here and waited for uh, several... Uh, Americans to come together in the administrator's office and about I think it was around uh, between 8 and 8.30 that morning he came into this office he first shot Dr. Martha who was using the telephone in the back back here going to use the telephone um, then it's my understanding that he shot uh, he shot Mr. Bill at his desk and uh, Kathy Garrity who was um, having a meeting with Mr. Bill at the time. Whatever their feelings about America's foreign policies, most Yemenis condemned the attack. We walked out, about 30 of us, expats, and uh, we were just uh, enveloped by the people of Jippa. And they fell on us and they cried with us. And it was just a, a great moment of healing for, for all of us. I really love this place. Nearby in the town of Ib, President Saleh's government has arrested scores of men with links to Afghanistan. Our hopes of a quiet arrival soon vanished. Since we've arrived in Ib, police has been driving ahead of us, clearing the way with a loudspeaker. They've been virtually everywhere where we've gone. I'd arranged to meet some of the families of suspects still in jail. My escorts stopped this happening. Instead, they took me to see someone they'd chosen, a detainee who'd received military training in Afghanistan under the Taliban, but had recently been released. Local officials gathered around to ensure he said the right things. His name was Ahmed Khaid. For a man who trained with the Taliban in Afghanistan, he was remarkably conciliatory. He says that even though he believes that there is a Zionist American conspiracy against Islam, that doesn't entitle him to fight it. He says with the military training that he has received in Afghanistan, the only reason for him to pick up arms would be to defend his country. I asked him whether he even felt a hint of annoyance about being arrested. He says that he never committed any crimes or terrorist acts. He has no misgivings towards the government for arresting him. For those escorting me, the interview had gone according to plan. 
was taken to meet another recently released prisoner. We visited by police again. Everywhere we've been today, there's been police. We see you everywhere we go. <laughs> Hi. Rashad Saeed was waiting. As I entered his house, he asked me to wear Balto, then gave it to me as a gift. In the 1980s, thousands of Yemenis went to Afghanistan to fight the Russians. He was one of them. Can you hold that? Our minder made careful notes of what Rashad said. When he fought in Afghanistan, it was as America's friend. He says, when I went to Afghanistan, that was something that had international support. Everybody was behind fighting the Russians at the time, including the superpowers like America or the United Kingdom. After 9-11, his Afghan links became cause for arrest. Rashad said, in my case, the security forces weren't right, but they didn't have much choice. There were a lot of extremists around at the time, and... Nobody is perfect and people will m make mistakes and that is in effect what happened in my case. We've just snuck up to the roof to do this bit of filming because something really quite extraordinary happened today. We've been suspecting that we were followed for quite a while and then suddenly today we got the proof. When we checked out of hotel, we were given our bill, and on it were some long-distance phone calls that none of us had made. And when we quizzed reception, they revealed to us, which is extraordinary, that the internal intelligence officers who'd followed us and checked into our hotel had made the calls, and they had the nerve to actually charge it to our bill. <laughs> Nearby, a reminder of the connections that plague Yemen's reputation. I've been told that this building right here is the school that was attended by Osama bin Laden's youngest and favorite wife. She is, in fact, Yemeni, and she was recommended to him by a fellow Yemeni, by an assistant, a high-ranking assistant to Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden's wife was someone we were never going to be allowed to visit. We are told that Amal still lives somewhere around here, somewhere around Ib, but she's nowhere to be found at the moment, and we're told that the government doesn't like journalists to interview her. We travel towards the capital, Sana'a. There's been no major Al-Qaeda attack in Yemen for over a year, but the threat is on everyone's mind. Okay, shukran. So, Yemeni newspapers. Yes, Yemeni newspapers. Okay, good, that's what I need. Yes, for government. Shukran. Government and opposition? Yes, yes. So I've got both. I wanted both because the big news today was that a group that's calling themselves the Yemeni branch of Al-Qaeda has threatened the, to carry out big strikes here in Yemen against Western targets as well as a major impending strike in America. They said they will do that because they've given an ultimatum to the government. The government has not reacted to it. So now it's time to attack, they say. Fear of Al-Qaeda has scared off foreign investment and destroyed tourism. The night I was in the old city of Sana'a, I didn't meet a single tourist. It feels safe, but recent events have damaged Yemen's reputation again. Only a short while ago, three stabbings occurred on three consecutive nights, one of them in this area. The target in all three incidents were tourists, and the newspapers wrote that the man who carried out the stabbings was somebody who was so upset about Saddam Hussein's capture and the pictures that were shown on television that he took his rage out on foreign tourists. It's become blatantly clear that nobody's speaking to us freely whenever we are with our minders. And they have to be with us every time we leave the hotel. We told our minder we were taking the morning off. 
In fact, I'd arranged to meet a human rights lawyer who'd acted for many of the suspects the government had arrested. Hello. 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 Hello exposed to a degree of torture, they've been kept in solitary confinement, they've been exposed to extremely strong light, uh, and they've been prevented from sleeping, but not all circumstances are known, so there could be other things that are going on. No one even knew how many people the government had detained. Reasons leading to arrests have been so unfounded sometimes. Uh, it could be that one of the detainees just said, I had lunch with so-and-so on a certain day. So this next person is getting arrested just for having had lunch with one of the previous detainees. That's all. Uh, all the Yemenis uh, hold this uh, anti-Arab anti American uh, and these thoughts. He condemns uh, terrorism, but says siding with America is difficult for Yemenis. So the thing is that it's actually hundreds, thousands, if not really the vast majority of Yemenis who harbor very strong anti-American feelings. What the authorities don't want is for this to be expressed in public. We joined up again with our minder to visit a major center of religious education. We're on our way to Aleman University. It is a place that for a long time has had the reputation of being an extremist education center and it has attracted students from all over the world. The head of the university has denounced terrorism, but the government is still nervous. It now forbids foreigners to enroll here. We're just going to see if we can find somebody to talk to us. I have heard from another journalist that the last time he came here, and this was a local journalist, the last time he came here with a camera, it was actually wrestled off him and they were dragged inside the compound and held there for several hours. There's a guy with a gun coming. So it's... The university fears both the Americans and the Yemeni government. They also distrust journalists. Why, why is it that we can't go and film? It's never possible for nobody. But, but why is that? The government is doing more than clamping down on suspects. It says it wants to tackle the root of the problem by championing interpretations of Islam which denounce violence. They are sending theologians into prisons to argue Al-Qaeda is wrong. Judge Hamoud Hittar leads the effort. He told me it was a question of persuasion. Judge Hittar is saying an extremist is so convinced of what he's doing that really there are only two options of dealing with him, either kill him or change his mind. And of course killing was not what they intended to do, so they sat down to change the, their minds. And what they did is use the Quran because he says the violent acts carried out depended on passages of the Quran that had been misinterpreted. So they worked and used the Quran to install a new version of Islamic thinking in the extremist minds. Throughout Yemen, there is a battle for hearts and minds. I had an audience with Yemen Sheikh of Sheikhs, a hugely influential figure. I've just arrived at the palace of Sheikh Abdullah, and it's an amazing house, and right outside him are all these people waiting to ask him favors, waiting for him to speak jurisdiction, um, but most of all they're poor and they want his help. Sheikh Abdallah al Ahmar is the Speaker of Parliament, but he is also the traditional leader of all of Yemen's hundreds of tribes. He is the link between the emerging modern state and Yemen's tribal power base. 
All around the Dubai, people are arguing now to get their cases heard first. Some of these cases are actually before the courts. The people are still approaching Sheikh Abdullah because they're saying they've got no face in the courts. They're slow, they're expensive, they need a lawyer in order to appear there, so they much prefer traditional resolution. وجل المواقف كلها ما يهاب يوم الحكام العرب ما تكلموا للشيخ كل مراف الراس جابها. This man has come to ask Sheikh Abdullah for a favor, and he's also reciting a poem. In the tradition of the praise poem, he is calling Sheikh Abdullah a lot of names, obviously all positive. He's calling him brave, he's calling him courageous, and he's highlighting the fact that Sheikh Abdullah is so courageous that he criticizes Bush and he criticizes the Americans when he sees fit. All this puts Sheikh Abdullah at the center of the battle for hearts and minds. Even when there's terrorism involved, for example, when there were the clashes between the government and the forces, the soldiers, tribal soldiers in Marib, it was Sheikh Abdullah who was called in to mediate. Are you ever concerned about the level of anger that you find here in Yemen against the Americans? His answer isn't what the Americans want to hear. Sheikh Abdullah says he's really concerned about the anger that he sees here in Yemen being directed against the Americans. And he said the key problem in that is, is that the war on terror is actually not really just a war on terror, but it's a war that is being directed against Muslims. He believes the war on terror can't be won without solving the issue of Palestine. Yes, the Americans might want to fight the war on terror, but people here are looking at Palestine and they're looking at the American hearts and what they're really doing to Arab people, and that's where the Americans are going wrong. Sheikh Abdullah, shukran. Shukran. His message was clear. Yemen's alliance with America is one of necessity, but not of choice. Our time was up, but the sheikh still had a point to make. The actual terrorism is what is, the United, what is Israel is performing now against the Palestinians with the support of the United States. What I carry in my feelings is the feelings of all Yemenis. What I have expressed is the exhibition of all Yemenis. Thank you very much again. There was a last you, photo opportunity, an exercise for American trained special forces. This is Yemen displaying its new credentials in the fight against al-Qaeda. Is the thing that we're really proud of the storming of a supposed terrorist hideout. The Yemeni government has made a hard nosed decision to play America's game. But the equation is finely balanced. Events in Iraq, in Palestine, in Saudi Arabia could alter everything at any moment.